Lead Time is a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective, hosted by Tim Allman and Jack Kalliberg. Lead Time taps into biblical wisdom for practical solutions to today's burning issues. Each podcast confronts real-time struggles facing the local church in a post-Christian culture. Step into the action with the ULC at uniteleadership.org. This is Lead Time. Happy day. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here with Jack Kalberg. It is a beautiful day. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. As we're talking today with David Lukey. And uh, Dave, I have been following you and your blogs, your writing on uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. You have been speaking to my heart, even though we've never met each other. So first off, say, uh, I want to say thank you for even joining us today on Lead Time to bless our our family and uh, tell us your story, Dave. Kick us off with your your ministry story. Traditional path to ministry uh, at our church schools, St. Louis Seminary. Wasn't so excited about ministry when I finished the seminary. In fact, uh, to tell you a secret, I was the farthest from God when I graduated from seminary wow. and uh, went on to get an MBA and a PhD in organizational behavior at Washington University. Um, stayed on in the administration, had a fast track career to vice chancellor, then went to Valparaiso to teach for four years and then out to Fuller Seminary as vice president and, uh, prof- and an associate professor. Wow. So say more. I think folks are, are interested in how do you go to seminary and kind of come out and, and kind of lose, not faith, I didn't necessarily <laughs> hear that, but not at all, but, but maybe like this isn't what I thought it would be. And um, so I'd, tell us, drill down on that just a little bit. Well, I was big into interpreting scripture and, a, and another step between college and seminary is I spent a year as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Heidelberg in Germany, right at the source of all of the newer biblical criticism. And what I missed was a compulsion for ministry. If in fact, this is just oral tradition and there's no real meat behind it. Um, What turned me around is to recognize that, um, what are the results? If in fact, scripture is not authoritative and we're seeing that in terms of liberal uh, denominations declining pretty rapidly. If you don't have a message from God that changes lives, then why bother with being a minister? Hmm. Yeah. So you grew up in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, right, yes. David? And and still are a part of that tradition, uh, would you been, claim? Been ordained for 52 years. <laughs> I'd say you're a part. Yeah. I'd say you're a part. So. <laughs> A visitor, circuit visitor, so I'm even involved in the administration a little bit. Yeah. So tell us uh, about your experience in academia as, uh, I mean, our vice chancellor and all that, even even to what many people would say today is, is maybe a more liberal seminary there at, at Fuller while, while still maintaining a confessional, very uh, traditional, biblically-based mindset as, a, as an ordained pastor. So tell us about th- that experience in academia. Enjoyed it, obviously did well, uh, taught the MBA course on organizational behavior but there's something missing in the kind of university experience I had that you don't talk about God. Uh, That's just not a topic. Uh, I felt Fuller was my spiritual home. I hate to say that, but much more than than our uh, Concordias. Uh, What excited me is a very strong sense of mission Hmm. and uh, well, church growth in particular, that's probably old hand by now, but that was the cutting edge when I was uh, at Fuller Seminary and I became the Missouri Synod spokesman for church growth in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, The mission people at uh, the Synod headquarters ran me around to all sorts of districts and Synod entities talking about church growth. Uh, and it felt good, and I really enjoyed it. I, the, a sense of mer- mission. It's the 
the church administration without a sense of, of a purpose and without a sense of growing something just is not very compelling. Uh, so that's what I found so interesting and, and compelling about church growth studies. And then finally came the time, I didn't get to that part of the story, um, where I felt a, re a real need to put together, put into use what I was teaching. So I took a call back to Cleveland, my hometown, to plant a church. And that I did, uh, pastored it for six years, then went over to the larger Royal Redeemer as the administrative pastor and retired half time as a missions pastor. So that's quite a long time in that mission pastor role. And I'm still uh, involved at Royal Redeemer. I have an office there and participate in events. So it's been a great opportunity for me. And I'm very thankful for senior pastor Jim Martin for finding a place for me in my own particular interests. Hmm. Hey, David, a quick follow-up question. I'm, I'm curious to hear about this from your perspective, because you're an insider, but then also an outsider because of your work with Fuller. So what, what would you say, there seems to be um, a skepticism of the church growth movement. What, how would you explain the root of that skepticism? I don't understand it, uh, other than it's different. Um, and it's evangelical, it's not Lutheran, and we Lutherans get very nervous about anything that isn't Lutheran, uh, which is to our disadvantage. We are ultimately an immigrant church, and we stand right. apart from everybody else, and I think that's to our disadvantage and to our weakness. So I'm very strong on evangelical, uh, and I really have spent the last 30 years or so trying to open up Missouri Synod to the kind of mission emphasis uh, that I find at Fuller. Hmm. So there's a there's an argument uh, that takes place often on social media between people that don't know one another, which is a shame, um, on the divide between confession and mission, and and the two groups. It kind of it kind of mirrors a lot of the the political polarization of the day and age, which is very very sad to Jesus, I believe, as it relates to unity being a winsome witness to the to the world. But we kind of have have polarized ourselves along that confession and missional line. Would you speak to that? What are your thoughts around that? I don't understand it, uh, and I think that's a weakness. Uh, it, it, we're so oriented towards theology, and we're so in. Uh, self-enclosed. Uh, I was once sitting in the vice president for academic affairs office at the seminary I went to, and he had a collection of all the books written by Missouri, by Concordia faculty. Every one of them was published by CPH, the church publisher. None of them were addressing concerns that got outside Missouri Synod. That's a pretty self-enclosed uh, group and they just talk to each other. Hmm. When, I, uh, when I wrote the Evangelical Style and Lutheran Substance, the uh, ministry specialist at Concordia wrote a glowing review of it, and um, they had to commission their own pastor, their own professor to run it down and show why it didn't fit. And that's a mentality that uh, still is there, I think. Confessional has been um, expanded all out of proportion. And my own view is I just wish they, were be, they would be confessional enough to realize what it really means. I've written a book on the other story of Lutherans at worship, and it's very clear in the formula of conquer that every congregation has the right to add or change or subtract from the ceremonies. That's a dressing worship. And they don't understand that. Uh, so, and also I have a disagreement about Article 5 of the Augsburg Confession, which I wish they would take much more seriously. The confessions mm -hmm. are great. I have, I mean, I love the confessions. That's the foundation of ministry. I just wish they'd take it more seriously. Yeah. Um, David, this is fantastic. I, I've often, Tim and I have been blessed to 
hang out with uh, some of the other leadership development um, entities that are non-denominational. We've done a lot of work with leadership networks, been through some of their accelerators. And it's been a, an incredible blessing for me to learn from other churches, their approach to mission, their approach to the church as a system, right? And the way I, I see things is I feel incredibly blessed. I love our theology. I just think our systems are terrible. <laughs> and for some reason, our culture doesn't allow us to look outside of ourselves to get better systems. And I, I'm deeply frustrated by that. I think that's kind of at the heart of the ULC. We want to open that up without sacrificing our confessions. Can, I guess to me, confession just means we've got a collection of confessions that is true exposition of the Bible, and it doesn't need to be anything more than that. And there's still tremendous freedom um, to be missional and even should be compelled to be missional and to experiment, to build, measure, learn uh, innovative ways to spread the gospel. Well, God bless you. <laughs> You're doing what you ought to do. Um, yeah. And and I, I've kind of given up apology uh, doing apologies for our church. We're an immigrant church and we just look in on ourselves and miss all the excitement that's out there in ministry and other places. I've been writing recently about community churches that are mm. growing fast. I assume you have some in your, well, I know you have some in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, they're exciting and they're very biblical. Uh, and we have a competitive inferiority complex over against a lot of them. So that what I say just raises hackles on the part of so many of our pastors. I mean, we have the truth. How dare they uh, think that they have the truth? And that's just mm -hmm. not the case. They're very biblical. Yeah, I think a lot of our struggles um, are not around content and theology. It's more around sociology. Absolutely. And that's my background in organizational behavior. Uh, sociology, psychology, motivation, that's my big thing. And we just get the motivation for the Christian life wrong. Uh, it revolves in our case, mostly around shoulds. You should do this, you should do that. And that doesn't really connect and, and uh, change people very much. What changes people? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. So talk, talk about, talk about the Holy Spirit. You've, I've, I've loved your writing on, on the Holy Spirit. And, and even in our denomination, you know, we love the father creator. We, we obviously elevate the cross of the crucified and risen Jesus, the blood of Christ covering all of our sins. And yet, as it relates to interaction with the Holy Spirit, often there's a corporate skepticism I've found. So talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, very significant for me was spending a couple of years studying Gordon Fee's book on the empower. Uh, well, I just lost the name. So yeah, God's empowering power, empowering. Now, oh, let me give me a minute. I'll get the title off of my shelf. The Holy God's, Spirit is all about empowerment. God's empowering <laughs> presence. That's the name of it. God's yeah. empowering presence. Uh, okay. 169 references to the Holy Spirit in Paul's writing, mm -hmm. and he goes through all of them. And in contrast, by the way, it's only 80 or so references to grace, so that uh, some scholars consider the Holy Spirit to be much more central to Paul's theology than grace or being in Christ. Um, and I worked through that and I worked through his systematic theology that, that he puts together after all of that. And I find that is the framework, particularly focusing on uh, fruit of the spirit and uh, the gifts of ministry. Uh, and I've kind of put together in my own mind uh, a very simple logic. And that is that when we take in the spirit when he moves us, we automatically become motivated by the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, mm -hmm. peace, patience. And that's all part of the abundant life that Jesus came to give us, John 10, 10. 
Uh, I don't remember ever in all of my years in Lutheran circles hearing about the abundant life. Maybe you have in your circles, but no, and that's the ultimate as far as uh, I'm concerned for life in this world. Of course, we're headed towards heaven, that's a given. But in this life, Jesus came to bring about a better quality of life. And how does that happen? Well, it's the Spirit moves us into His fruit. It's a very simple logic. Yeah, yeah. The narrative that I heard um, that I, that is like shaping, I think, the culture of our, our church body is this kind of defensive and purity-oriented posture. Um, basically saying we're just kind of holding on. We're, we're kind of a weak, we're declining. We're just kind of holding on um, until Jesus comes back. When Jesus doesn't talk, I mean, he, he gave us, he says, wait for the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. Martyreo, you know, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. This, there's an offensive, there's a propulsion that's all about the Holy Spirit moving us forward for love and good deeds. With the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the character that comes from Christ, the spirit of the risen Christ living, storming the living gates. within, storming the gates. And so, yeah, um, speak to that that move. And and it, it really is a character issue, I think, within our, our church body. Um, of of maybe even doubting, questioning, like um, emotion. So let, let's just talk maybe the emotion that comes because when we think the Holy Spirit, which moves like the wind, we, we a lot of our minds go all the way over to Pentecostalism and kind of giving over to emotions and and that's going to lead us maybe to doubt our faith or or think that, man, if I'm not experiencing this high, that I'm not close to Christ or he doesn't love me, just go a, drill a little bit deeper into an appropriate understanding of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, as one of the sources said that I've just written about, um, there's the icy intellectual and the fiery emotional and we think Pentecostal, and in our Lutheran history, Schwermerai, uh, mm-hmm. the people who caught the Spirit in 1525 that told him to revolt, and um, the result was about 300,000 were killed. You don't rebel against the, the emperor, uh, so we shut down. And by the way, in terms of history, that was one of your questions. Uh, what what happened that we lost the spirit? Well, we fell in with Calvinists. Luther had the spirit up to 1525. Calvin came along and said, uh, there are no more miracles. Um, that was necessary in the New Testament, but that doesn't happen anymore. And when you're talking about the spirit, you're talking the spirit world. And when you're talking about the spirit entering into people and changing their motivation, uh, that's a spiritual thing. That's a miraculous thing. Um, we can get into John 10 or John uh, 3 with the spirit influencing human spirit. That's all miraculous and it can't be pinned down. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and therefore we don't really have any uh, any role for the spirit when you come with that kind of a, a, a mentality should i say more no uh, you're speaking basically around cessationist theology and we have some cessationists which means the miraculous gifts of the holy spirit were gone um with the apostles so we and Calvin, you just kind of lean into Calvin, kind of moving us in that direction. Uh, I, I think there are some cessationists um, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, as as well. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Cessation meaning no more miracles. Is that what you? No more miracles. Yep. I'll, I'll say this. I, I've done a lot of studies. That's my background, my organizational behavior, and I did one on prayer a random sample of 300 Lutheran ministers, would you believe that 80% said that they have either experienced or witnessed a miracle? That's 80% of our our pastors, and yet we never talk about it. That's because we're afraid to, or so many pastors are afraid to, it's there. Um, And why is it that we're afraid to talk about something miraculous happening? 
Well, it's you in know, the so sacraments why, why every time it? we experience yeah, it, right? Exactly. The sacraments are a mystery, a miracle. Well, that's right. Ultimately, yes. Uh, and that's somehow been tamed. And you get me into a side thing. I wait, think we make too much out of the sacraments, the Lord's Supper. And I think that in the liturgical renewal that led into the goal of weekly uh, communion, we took a wrong turn. Uh, that's a post-Second World War phenomenon when uh, um, a number of leaders, particularly at Concordia St. Louis, were so big that you have to go back to the ultimate liturgical of the, 14, of the fourth century and I was just wrong. Uh, we we hobbled ourselves by letting that prevail. Huh. Well, you're speaking of something that I have not even considered. Um, yeah, the the centrality of of the sacrament. You think it's had even too high of a view? I'm trying to summarize what I hear you saying. Maybe too high of a view, and that has maybe downplayed the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the vocational lives of the body of Christ? Is that kind of what I hear you Absolutely. Saying? That's not Lutheran history, by the way. For centuries, um, uh, the sacrament was done once a quarter, once every three months. Hmm. And uh, that's my other story of Lutherans at worship. We just don't understand our own history. Now that all gets dismissed as too Calvinistic and we want to be Lutheran. Uh, and I don't understand why it's so important to be Lutheran versus being a very good uh, missionary out there. Um, and that was the mentality, of we need to be uniquely Lutheran. Well, so what? <laughs> uh, the question is whether it's effective. Are we getting the gospel out there? And whether or not it's Lutheran is, uh, it's, I suppose it's a marketing question. And obviously it's been a failure because we're declining. It didn't well, work very the, well. The brand of Lutheran isn't what people think it is. If you're a conservative Lutheran and you insist, we've walked through this in our own local church context. Um, we've come to discover if you use the word Lutheran, that doesn't mean that people associate you immediately with a conservative LCMS confessional. It means you, you're associated with the ELCA, which <laughs> has very different views on the Bible, for instance, whether it's authoritative or inerrant. And so a lot of times when we deal with other church leaders in the community, if we tell them we're Lutheran, they're thinking, okay, you guys do gay marriage and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh no, that's not, that's not what it is that we do, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, a Lutheran means ethnic to a lot of people, although right. that's the older generation and they're dying off. So I'm not sure that identity will persist, but we're just on the sideline. Right. And part of yeah. the Concordia Seminary that I went to was a desperate effort to become mainstream rather than being set off as an ethnic group. Uh, and hence Anglican became very significant in the liturgical movement and all that sort of thing. And in the process, they picked up mainline seminary emphasis on the new exegetical stuff that came out of Germany. And that sort of crippled me as a student uh, at the seminary, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, just kind of destroyed the desire for ministry. Mm -hmm. Hey, church leader, an exciting opportunity for you. We are running our 2022 and 2023 cohort through an accelerator, uh, building together multiple churches coming together, and we've only got spots for five churches. So you will learn over that year with three different gatherings from a Monday at noon to Wednesday at noon, you will learn the structure, systems, and culture centered in your big, unique why, why your church exact, exactly exists. You'll learn a number of different strategies to release disciples for the sake of those who do not know Jesus. So come and join our accelerator 2022, 2023. Just go to uniteleadership.org to learn more. So, this is a time in history where you say the desire for for ministry, many pastors, the recent Barna study, basically four out of 10 pastors in the last year or so are considered tapping out saying this is too hard for me. 
Um, given your 50 plus years of, of pastoral ministry, David, would you give three to five words of, of wisdom for pastors trying to lead in these complex, difficult times? Well, first of all, it's no place for just having a job. Mm. Um, and if in fact your attitude is one of, this is a job for me, uh, it's gonna be a very tough job. Uh, yeah. And in fact, I, I think we are producing many graduates for whom it is a job. And one of the attractions uh, of going to our seminaries is that you're guaranteed a job at the end of it. Uh, and that's just wrong. Uh, no other church body does it the way we do, that you're guaranteed a job. If you go to seminary, you've got to be able to sell yourself to a congregation to be their pastor. And mm -hmm. that already, uh, orients a pastor to doing something effective, to doing showing that they're able to do a job well. That's just not our background. Wow. Well, that is very fascinating. We are very interested in, in that topic. Well, um, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, no, I, just an observation. <laughs> this is through, through um, the Luther House. There's a lot of LCMC folks that go through there, and their process is where's the, first. Where's the Luther House? In Luther House is um, it's an online program with the Kairos oh. University. Yeah, um, so I deal with a lot. I've, I'm interacted with a lot of LCM MC students, and their process is first they first a person has to work in the local church, and based on their character and their competency, that's what causes them to get a call in the ministry, and then they send them to seminary. So Good. they're tested. Uh, they're tested on character first. That's then, the way it ought to be. Yeah. And you've got a question that you had posed to me uh, about um, what other way, I forgot uh, yeah. what the role of the local church is. I'm all for finding people who do ministry well and then bringing them along, raising them up into greater leadership and bringing education to them. Uh, first of all, you define the ability and then you do the training to become more capable. When I went off to become, to quote, study for the ministry, that was the phrase then, uh, there was no relationship to capability. You just went off and did academic studies. Uh, and whether or not that produced a good minister was kind of irrelevant. Uh, and that was at a time when, when church life was very defined, and in fact, it could be a job. And I think for a number of graduates, it has been a job. We had a recent graduate that uh, first of all talked about uh, sabbaticals and taking a Sabbath and not having to work very hard. And I thought that is a weird thing for a young graduate in ministry. Uh, to be worried about not having to spend so much time on the job. And I thought there's something wrong there. <laughs> yes, there, yes, there yes, there is. There is. <laughs> so we, we uh, could talk about this for a long period of time. Um, and we are, one of our missions is to highlight the need for local churches to raise up the next generation, not just pastors, but directors of Christian education, teachers, administrators, et cetera, evangelists, for goodness sake. We need, for looking at the rise in, in the church in the global south, we've got to highlight the need for evangelists, those that can teach other people to tell the story, the greatest story of the biblical narrative and God's work in the world. So yes, we must talk about education. That being said, we're going to put that aside. Other words of wisdom for, because <laughs> everybody knows we can go off. Other words of wisdom, David, on uh, a pastor pastoring in these hard, chaotic times. When I uh, was teaching the doctor of ministry course, I realized that uh, one need that I had to address was simple time management. And that is when you wake up in the morning, what's your objective for the day? And what kind of priorities are you going to put on spending your time? For me, that becomes natural. I mean, I'm an administrator. I've got a proven track record that you're always setting priorities. So many pastors, oh, that's, I think my wife's gonna get that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Uh, Let her get it. Call from is that, so this is a, 
This is a generational thing. Was that a land? Was that a landline yes, with a cord, is. David? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. So I, young young leaders, there those that still exists. That does exist. Yeah. I have a cell phone, but I don't use it. It's, I keep it in the car. It's for my convenience if I run into trouble. And I live on the computer, but I like my keyboard. Oh, it's and that's red. actually a voice <laughs> mail like machine where you've got a play button and you can rewind it. David, we love you. And it's just it's just interesting. Side note, how rapidly culture oh, has changed it's amazing. today. It is it is amazing. So you were talking about time management. Well, a lot of young people don't have it. And a lot of young pastors are not administrators. And if you're not an administrator, you're not going to manage your time very well. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching leadership for 50 years, and I'm not sure it can be taught. I think it's an instinct. I, mm -hmm. You can describe it, you can tell people what to do, but whether they're actually able to do it is a whole different question. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you should find out people who are actually capable and demonstrate that they can do ministry and then bring the education to them. Yeah, not yeah. everyone is a leader. I agree 100%. They're, they're in our congregations, but there are certain intangible um, qualities given by God, gifts, leadership, administration, that have been given to some and, and not, not to all. And um, that is not building up hierarchy, should not build pride. We should have the humility of Christ in acknowledging those those gifts. But as you're looking, so let's just drill down into leadership a little bit more. What are the qualities of, so you mentioned time management. If, if our leaders are looking for leaders in, in uh, pastors looking for other leaders within the local context, what other qualities identify a healthy leader? They get things done. Uh, they're not <laughs> fussing around all the time, worrying about this or that, and that's probably the primary one. I had a fast track career, I, I mentioned at Washington University, that's because I got things done. <laughs> yeah. In particular, I turned around an admissions office in one year, and wow. that's what you look for. Uh, and it's, well, I'm answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So results-oriented. Uh, goal-oriented is a yeah. better way to put it. Yeah, yeah. goal-oriented. So you, um, you you may offend, and this is when we when we call out leadership qualities. There are some pastors who are like, "Wow, all of my life is reaction." Yes. All of my life is waiting for uh, other people to have a problem and I kind of come in to, to fix. And so this kind of underlying shame. And then I just know I compare myself to like these other guys. I've heard this Unite Leadership thing. I don't talk leadership like at all. Like that's where some of our, our pastors are at. And I think I think it's a it's a large number. They just feel inadequate. You're not an adequate pastor. So what do you what do you say to that leader, that pastoral leader who does not view themselves? And frankly, some of the intangible leadership qualities may not may not be found for them. Well, what do you say to them? What's their role in the church? Find a big church and take some kind of an assistant role uh, under somebody else's mm -hmm. leadership. But then again, mm -hmm. if they can't get things done, they're probably not attractive to a senior pastor for his own staff. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing is leave ministry if you can't do it and you can't keep your your priorities straight then this is not the place for you used yeah. to be i mean even through the 60s or 70s uh church the pastoring was mostly preaching and doing the sacraments uh and it worked but of course that world is gone and now you need to be a leader. And if you're not a leader, then you're probably not the one for the job you have. And David, so we, we think of leaders as developers, that their primary job is to develop other people. If they're doing everything, they're, they're never going to get out of being reactionary all the time. What's been your experience with that? What would be tips to be a better developer of people? When I was administrative pastor with Jim Martin, a senior pastor, we tried for a while to work out a salary scheme 
where if you were doing the job yourself, you'd get a salary, but if you were getting the job done through others, you would get a higher salary. And that became the basis that. for promotion, that uh, your job is not to do the teaching, but your job is to raise up other teachers, or in particular, youth ministry. Um, where was this? Royal Redeemer, where I've been now for 32 years. Uh, never quite worked out. I know. I, we I love have, the idea, though. <laughs> yeah, well, make it very explicit. Your job is to raise up other people to do the ministry at hand. Um, well, I'm sorry to get this like Captain Obvious here, <laughs> but that's what Jesus did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what that's what the apostles did. Greater things you'll do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the message multiplied. Like, how did we miss the simplicity of the discipleship multiplication movement of, of Jesus? I just I just don't get it. It's it's very sad. So what do you think? We're going to get a little dark here for a minute. We'll end on a light note. What do you think um, the average LCMS church will look like in 10 years? Smaller. Uh, no question about it. And fewer. Um I'm in the Ohio district. We used to have 176 congregations. The last count I heard was 150. But even more significant is a number I just heard. And that is 65 of our 154 congregations are not healthy enough to call a full-time pastor. Churches don't die rapidly. They slowly shrink and they die finally when something happens to the building and they can't afford to do that anymore. So yes, we've got, we have a concept of ministry that does not fit our times and it mm. will get smaller. Do you think, do you think she can be revived? Do you think she can handle the innovation that would be needed um, to bring a, to bring a new day? Or will we just continue as a denomination on this slow decline and and um, and pridefully hide behind our insecurities? We I think we know we're not being faithful if we're continuing to decline. We can justify it all we want, but we're not carrying out the mission of Jesus. But by by golly, we're we're orthodox and we're pure. Um, yeah. So do you think she can be turned around? I used to be part of the mega church conference, and it kind of sounds like you're a successor to them. I think they still met, but I knew the pastors, and there were about 50 congregations that met the criterion of megachurch, which for us is pretty low, and that's an average attendance of a thousand. And they go out and do their own thing. Uh, you're doing your own thing. And uh, I don't know about mid sized congregations, but the big ones don't worry about synod and they just do it. That's what we did at Royal Redeemer. We did not fit anybody's role. And all we ask of Synod is to leave us alone. That's not a very compelling vision for Synod, but so be it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that will, um, yeah, I don't know how long that's sustainable, to be quite honest. And I, I think we have, we have made um, Orthodox a very passive, let's just talk about systems theory and kind of organizational culture. I think we've institutionalized a very passive approach um, to, to leadership. We just kind of sit back, live and let live the small to the large. And, you know, you don't bother me. I won't I won't bother you rather than having the difficult conversations um, around the trajectory and then the systems that could be put in place to reverse the trajectory of a declining declining church body. And and if we're poked and we don't have the right solution, then we respond in passive aggressive ways. We've institutionalized uh, passivity. Uh, thoughts on that, David? Yeah, you're right on. Uh, and that's part of our history where we used to be successful because we were ethnic and people came and that worked through the 60s in suburbia when people moved out from the city into suburbia they looked for people like themselves and we had a lot of healthy churches well that's gone and we don't know how to adjust my you didn't ask about my view of Senate, but I'll give it to you. And that is that it'll become a mission agency. And that's about it. Um, mm. 
they will maintain a monopoly on seminary education, and that's too bad. Uh, we both, Maybe. we all agree on the alternative of raising up people to be leaders. I used to teach, by the way, in the old Delta program, distance education leading to ordination, where the district taught the first two years of what would be a six year college and seminary. Um, and I developed what I call the ministry specialist program for people who just took the two years without an intention of going to seminary. I think that's what you're talking about. And then what happened Good to morning. it? Well, instead of it being a source of fresh leadership, the seminaries clomped down and said, we're the only ones that are going to do this. And uh, I gave up. What's the sense of trying to maintain a program when there's not much support for it? Yeah. Yeah. By we're, the not, way, we're not giving up. That's why we're having this conversation. We're, we're not we're not giving up and we're making the case that where does the power and this is just good theology. Where does the power toward leader development lie? It doesn't lie in a higher institution. It doesn't even lie in a synod. It lies in the local church. That's what we believe. Absolutely. That's what our confessions say. That's yeah, absolutely. And, um, well, I won't go on a side discussion of no, the confessions. That, that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're pushing. We're pushing an overture through our district. I know that other districts are are favorable of it. Certainly not all of them, but our, our view is if somebody goes through like. In our case, we've got the Kairos program, uh, a solid Lutheran, solidly, you know, Lutheran program. They get an MDiv. They're serving in the local church. They've got the trust of the local church. They've demonstrated success in ministry. They're in alignment with our confessions, right? What reason could the synod have to deny that person colloquy? I can't see any biblical or confessional reason to deny that. And yet that option is not available. Sad to say, I think the attitude of a lot of ministers is I had to go off to seminary, I had to move my family, and I had to suffer, and therefore others should have to do the same thing. It's just simply <laughs> yeah. not a very Christian attitude. Yeah. It almost sounds sadistic a little bit uh, we've got, strange. We've got 11 students in this program right now. Zero of them would have moved to St. Louis right. or wherever zero of them would have gone to a residency program. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and you're sh shutting off the source. Of course, naturally, we don't have as many calling congregations anymore. Um, so it kind of balances itself out. By the way, as an old professor of organizational behavior, I would caution you to t about using the word system. Okay. I finally, I finally realized most people don't understand it. Uh, true. And, and therefore, yeah. you don't communicate very much when you say system. Uh, just I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And I very rarely do outside of talking to someone who understands systems theory, right. which I know, which I know you do. So good point. Good word of wisdom. Talk about group dynamics the way teams and people live together, uh, 100%. So thank you for that word of wisdom. Um, looking at the lifestyle of Jesus, the practices of, of Jesus for leadership development within the local church, what are you know three or four of, of Jesus's practices or values that we should live with today uh, to be a, a healthy leader within the local church? I think we have to talk about Jesus and Paul I think Jesus taught the basic relationships with God. He did not talk about church. Only once does it does the word church right. appear. Uh, and he did have the right approach of sending out his disciples and saying, now you go ahead and do what I've taught. I think we learn much more from Paul for whom church was everything. Um, and, and he had a much broader perspective and a compelling notion of ministry. So I'm not going to fulfill your ex uh, question about what do we learn from Jesus. Concentrate on Paul. That's the guy that we have to follow. And uh, everything that I do, I think, is very Pauline. I can back that up in all sorts of ways. The, the main teaching that's uh, relevant to church is the gifts of ministry in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. And again, we're back to 
criticizing our history, but uh, their, the concept of people having gifts that they do for the common good is just gone. Hmm. One of the professors that uh, uh, was at the seminary that I went when I went was Lawrence Wunderlich, who wrote a book on the half-known God, trying to resurrect the view of God, and he's got one paragraph about the gifts of ministry in 1 Corinthians 12. Can you imagine that? That's where the history has been. Um, and it, the concept of gifts of ministry is very fresh in our Missouri Synod with a lot of caution about it. Hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, yeah, what is, what is the caution around gifts of ministry? <clears throat> never been we've never done that before it's just pastor centric the pastor does everything right well yes we do have the view that the pastor does everything I so why are you my, leaning into people's gifts right if that's your view you got it um and well i just lost my thought uh the whole issue of ordination i think we've got wrong uh, and I think we build too much into um, Paul's letter to Titus, where we ground that concept of ordination and all Paul is saying, put some order into that church in Crete. It doesn't mean to separate a whole different class of people from everybody else. So I, I'm not big on ordination at all, and therefore it doesn't fit in Missouri Synod. And I mentioned the uh, Augsburg chapter or article five, which talks about de ministerium in the Latin. And I think that's all about ministry, not about ministers. And we just got it wrong. I said mm -hmm. that once to the systematic professors at Concordia St. Louis in the uh, days when PLI could afford to bring a lot of people together. And <laughs> they just couldn't process that. And of course, I've been a persona non grata for e e decades, uh, and I can see why they don't like me because I just simply think they're wrong. Yeah. Wow. So we, to summarize that, we have said that ministry is about one person or the ordained office rather than the ministry collective of the body of Christ within the local congregation. Yes. I think that's what Augsburg teaches us. And that seems to be very Lutheran, doesn't it? What, the Augsburg Confession? <laughs> well, uh, the AC, AC is obviously very Lutheran. But no, no, no. I mean, Luther's understanding of the priesthood of all, priesthood believers, of all believers and yeah. and uh, the, the gifts of vocation, a variety of different places using those gifts. Um, I think, yeah, we've. I, I agree with you. I think we've missed something very significant there. Um, and then, by the way, the translation that I grew up with, Tappert, very clearly in a footnote says that uh, this article on day ministerium does not apply to clergy. And here's the guy that knows the confessions backwards and forwards. I met him, by the way, when I was in at Heidelberg in Germany. And our guys just ignore the, the footnote. <laughs> Wow! If you, if you have any sort of <laughs> care and concern for uh, the history of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, you need to rewind the last two minutes and give some and pull out Tappert. I'm looking at my Book of Concord Tappert version yeah. right now. Many of you have it. Dust it off. Take a look at the footnote. That's 100. Footnote. So, <laughs> so uh, let's go one one more uh, word of wisdom from Paul um, for the church leadership. Well, pay attention to his fruit of the Spirit. That's the other thing in Wonderlook's book. Uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit gets one paragraph uh, in the whole book about what the Spirit does. And I think that's the heart of Paul's message, that when the Spirit comes, he changes people. A love, joy, peace, patience, all of those good fruit um, are the are the result and that's the abundant life that we live and we ought to be all about the positives uh they're there in paul he was constantly preaching what the spirit does to people and mm -hmm. it's not just leadership it's quality of life that's what i get out of uh, gordon fee's book on the empowering presence or the empowering god mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I, I don't understand why there has been that blank spot. I'll tell you another blank spot. Uh, Paper, our doctrine book, I don't know if he's still used. Uh, it is has still a used. Yep. Chapter on the Father, a chapter on the Son, and then a chapter logically that should be on the Holy Spirit. There's no chapter on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> um, it's a big problem. Yeah, that's a Peter, big what problem. What are we doing? He jumps right to the church. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the communion of saints, etc. And there's nothing on the Spirit. <laughs> Man, you are speaking our language there, David. This has been super, super fun and would love to have you back on because you are a uh, deep well of wisdom that needs to be tapped for the next generation of leaders within our church body. Um, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that, David? My email is D as in David, S as in Stuart Lukey at AOL.com. I have and a website, L -U -E -C -K -E. by the way. -E. Yeah. My right. website, website is whathappened.church, and that's where I have my blogs. And I just started a new series. Uh, tomorrow comes out the fourth called Reflections on Ministry, where I'm mm -hmm. taking the 130 blogs I wrote in recent years and trying to integrate them into an overall view. The overall theme, if I were to put a title, is Let the Spirit Shape Your Ministry. Uh, and Luther talks about in the small catechism, the spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies Lightens, the yeah. whole Christian church on earth. That's what we ought to be concentrating on. Amen. And I will get those chapters done in the next probably four or five months. And I hope to put that into a book form. You can't argue with it because call, gather, enlighten, sanctify, that's the vocabulary of our Lutheran confessions. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time today, David. You are a gift to us, to the body of Christ, to uh, the Unite Leadership Collective uh, family and listener. Uh, please, 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 by the power of the Spirit connected to the Word, go on mission, confessing Jesus as Lord, all for the sake of those who are walking in darkness in need of the light and the life that only comes from Jesus. To double down on John 10, 10, he came to give you not a ho-hum, kind of casual, passive, oh, the world's again. No, he came to give you life and life to the full that's found in confessing the name of Jesus, empowered by the gifts, the unique gifts that you have uh, given by the Holy Spirit. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. Thanks again, David, for being with us. You're and welcome. Jack, you are a gift to the body of Christ. Peace out. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC consults and brings together cohorts of congregations to build the culture, systems, and structures of intentional discipleship multiplication. To go deeper with us, create a free login on uniteleadership.org for access to exclusive materials and resources. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.